Another Spider-Man game is finally here, and like Insomniac's past two games, 2018's Spider-Man and 2020's Spider-Man Miles Morales, Spider-Man 2 is a highly polished roller coaster of AAA game design that combines top-notch animations and presentation with reinterpretations of favorite characters. It received high praise from critics, and while fans have had a few disagreements with story direction, for the most part, the word of mouth around Spider-Man 2 is that it's another great game in the Insomniac tradition which is no small feat for a follow-up to their last two Spider-Man titles. It wasn't good enough to win Game of the Year at the Game Awards, but then again, it was never a fair fight. But the prevailing quality hasn't stopped a small contingent of angry nerds from criticizing the game. Not for reasonable things, like features that were lacking that were in the previous entry, a lackluster suit selection, or Miles' new suit looking like a half-baked CW original. No, they're criticizing the game for wokeness. Spider-Man 2 is absolutely plagued with woke propaganda. Nothing is sacred anymore. Activists are running everything and quality and story are nowhere near important as things like diversity and representation. But Insomniac Spider-Man 2 is not just almost as equally boring as God of War, but also twice as woke, undeniably so. It'll be interesting to see the usual suspects try to pretend that this isn't clear political propaganda being shoved down our throat. You remember wokeness, right? We covered it a while ago, particularly how it's become a catch-all term used to criticized primarily by people who are uncomfortable with things like other races, gay people, and touching grass. But we're not here to relitigate that video. You can get the lowdown on all the stuff nerds hate and how nonsensical the go woke, go broke argument is if you go watch that video. Because today we're here to talk about just how woke Spider-Man 2 is. Not because of diversity points or ESG, but because Spider-Man has always been that way. Spoilers ahead. For the unfamiliar, Spider-Man 2 tells the story of Peter Parker, the original Spider-Man, and his protege Miles Morales, who has been through his own spider struggles and proven himself worthy to bear the title of Spider-Man in the spin-off game Miles Morales. The pair must juggle their regular lives and superhero responsibilities when two big new threats descend on New York, those being Kraven the Hunter and the symbiote monster Venom. I'll try and stay away from the specifics of the story because as a lifelong Spider fan, I know I enjoy going into it fresh. And the video doesn't need a whole recap of every event. If you haven't played it, there will be slight spoilers for side missions, and later I will spoil the ending and some late game events. But otherwise, I will try to keep this as spoiler free as possible. Much like the titular heroes, the discussion of Spider-Man being woke weaves an intricate web through several other topics to discuss. What do people mean when they accuse the game of pushing a social justice agenda? How does the game do that? And why would that be a bad or even surprising thing in a Spider-Man game? All of those topics I will go into, but first I want to briefly go into the history of Spider-Man as a character and talk about how the dreaded scourge of wokeness and progressive ideology is an integral part of that character. Brilliant science student Peter Parker was bitten by a spider which had accidentally been exposed to radioactive rays. Through a miracle of I want to start with a history lesson. Because when it comes to common complaints about progressivism in modern media, especially when it comes to franchises and characters with long histories behind them, a lot of complaints come down to things like wokeness being forced. But as I'll show, that's not really the case. In fact, if there's any character that should be open to progressive ideas, it would be Spider-Man. Let's talk about how the character was created first, because it's really important to understanding consistency behind that portrayal. And we can't talk about the origins of Spidey without talking about Stan Lee. There's a lot to say about Stan Lee, far more than the posthumous MCU-ified sainthood Disney has commodified him with. He was a complicated person who had several public controversies, including a falling out with co-creator Jack Kirby, who helped create many iconic characters like the Fantastic Four. But aside from all his personal and business dealings, Lee's time as a writer at Marvel was firmly rooted in a sense of responsibility he felt towards his very young audience, to not just use comics to educate them, but illuminate aspects of the world around them, including issues of social justice. See, in doing research for the history of Spider-Man, I was looking back through some old mailbag sections from the Stan Lee penned original Amazing Spider-Man run from the 1960s. I came across a curious letter from a mother 
who thanked Stan for his writing in The Howling Commandos, an ongoing World War II action comic that starred the original incarnation of Nick Fury. In the letter, she expressed heartfelt thanks that he depicted a nuanced, though still firm, lesson on bigotry and how it's never acceptable. I was intrigued, so I went to read the issue myself. In the comic, Sergeant Fury's squad has an accident during a training exercise, leading to a new teammate, Stonewall, who turns out, ironically enough for someone fighting Nazis, to be a racist. First, in the scene when he's offered to shake hands with the injured soldier he's replacing. At first, Nick Fury thinks he's just got a chip on his shoulder, or is trying to prove how tough he is, but soon enough he's revealed to be a bigot when he refuses to bunk with a black commando. Without time to get a new squad mate, Fury gives him a stern warning that he better not let any of his mates get hurt in the mission. Unable to follow orders from the Black Commando, Stonewall bungles an attack. Later, when talking to a Nazi POW, the prisoner remarks that someone like him should be fighting alongside the Nazis. And here I really see why a mother would want to write into Stan Lee to thank him. The depiction of bigotry here isn't simple, but a matter of moral grays, where even a bigot can be given a second chance to realize the error of his ways. The action-packed story continues as Stonewall is forced to fight side by side with someone whose race he had a problem with. He's injured and saved by a blood transfusion from the Black Commando in the end. He leaves the unit as Fury remarks he hasn't changed. But in the last few panels, he drops a note inferring he wants to write to the two men who saved his life, who he had been so unjustly racist towards. The comic ends with a classic Stan Lee lesson, Sergeant Fury saying, the seeds of prejudice, which can take a lifetime to grow, can't be stamped out overnight. But if we keep trying, keep fighting, perhaps a day will come when love thy brother is more than just an expression we hear in church. Whatever other things Stan Lee did during his time at Marvel, in the golden age of the publisher, he was focused on delivering stories that weren't just creative and entertaining, but had good messages. Messages that could teach kids about the world around them. Messages like this, that the world could be complicated, and the road to tolerance was long and hard fought, but an ideal to strive towards nonetheless. Despite what many think today, Comics at the time weren't just the domain of straight white kids. Going by the fan mail Stan would reply to in Spider-Man and other series, fans crossed every demographic imaginable, from adult women to young kids of color, even married couples and teachers. Some of my favorite fan letters are from kids excited to see Black Panther, who was co-created with Jack Kirby and was introduced as the first black superhero in 1966, when the civil rights movement was in full swing. I particularly like this letter from a kid praising the depiction of Wyatt Wingfoot, identifying with the character because he himself was mixed race and had indigenous ancestry. In the 1960s, comics were still seen by some as a waste of time that would rot children's brains, and Marvel played a big role in changing that narrative. If kids were interested in a story and they came across a word that they didn't understand, they would learn what it meant just through its use in the sentence by osmosis, so to speak. Or if they had to go to the dictionary and look it up, that's not the worst thing that could happen. It's why Stanley used $10 words like uncanny, so kids would have to look up what they meant and learn them. And one of the other many lessons he repeatedly sought to portray was standing up against bigotry and advocating for diversity as seen in the Howling Commandos. But this wasn't just a case of some one-off these principles of, dare I say, social justice were implicit in inspiring other great superheroes like the X-Men, and Lee was vocal about that fact. In this now famous mailbag page, Stan spoke openly against bigotry and racism, ending the note with the words, sooner or later, if man is to be worthy of his destiny, we must fill our hearts with tolerance, for then and only then will we truly be worthy of the concept that man was created in the image of God, a God who calls us all his children. So then, what does that have to do with Spider-Man? I mean, it's cool that he was a very progressive writer using his platform to educate children, right? But that doesn't mean Spider-Man has always been woke. He's just a straight white guy from Queens, which is true. In comics, Spider-Man was a instant smash success and aided by a 1967 TV series, quickly became a pop culture icon. But there were several things that set Spidey apart from Batman, Superman, and Marvel's stable of spandex-stretching superheroes. He didn't have a lot of money. He didn't have a lot of friends. He didn't have magic or alien powers or cool guns. The thing that made Spider-Man a relatable character from day one is the fact that Peter Parker is an everyman, a street-level superhero. He was a relatable character by design, and if the reader mailbags are anything to go by, that appeal stretched farther than young white boys 
from his very first appearance. In this 1977 interview, Stan lays out some of the Marvel philosophy for their heroes, which is to make them relatable through their flaws. We tried to make our characters have feet of clay. Now, poor Spider-Man. I mean, okay, he's pretty good at catching bad guys, but he's apt to get an allergy attack while he's fighting. He <laughs> worries about dandruff. He'll have an ingrown toenail, tears his costume. His Aunt May won't let him go out to save the world because he's not wearing his galoshes and it's snowing out. And uh, the funny thing is, I started doing that as a gag and really to keep myself awake, you know? And, and I found that the readers are as crazy as I am. They started enjoying this sort of thing. And on the subject of flaws, I always think of this interview Stan Lee did for the Daredevil DVD when the subject of representation comes up because I think it shows how much someone who's not part of a group might not think about how much it could mean for that group to see themselves depicted in media. In this example, blind people who were being read Daredevil when the comics first came out. And a number of people had written articles in different papers and magazines about the fact that all of our heroes, all the ones that I had come up with, were flawed. So I thought, well, i got to find a guy with another flaw. That seems to be what turns people on. Strangely enough, I was afraid that there might be a negative reaction to a blind superhero, primarily among blind people. I felt they would feel, you know, what's this guy trying to do? We can't do things like that. Is this some sort of a, a parody? And I, I was nervous about it. And then I was amazed to find we got more fan mail in the beginning from charities for the blind. They said that the people that we're involved with are so grateful that there is a blind superhero and they love that idea. And oh man, what a relief that was for me. It, 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 it felt good to get that kind of mail. With all that in mind, I particularly like this clip from a 2002 documentary. Mind you, this was over a decade before Miles Morales came onto the scene, years before the MCU was even an idea. One of the very few comic book characters, even back then, that, that was covered from head to toe. Like, if Captain America, you still yeah. have this much of his face. Spider-Man's completely enveloped in his costume. Oh, you so know the good thing about mystery. that? Yes. You could be any kid. Yeah. You could be black. You could be Asian. You right. could be Indian. You right. could be anything and imagine you were in that costume. Right. So I think that made it relevant mm. to everybody everywhere. Peter Parker was meant to be an incredibly broad, identifiable template of a character, someone that almost anyone could identify with. At the risk of citing anecdotal arguments, I want to bring up a blog post from the podcast Amazing Spider Talk, written by Brian Jacob, as a reaction to online discourse about a 2015 casting of Spider-Man. It's a very personal post that I'll link below, but I think it gives some valuable perspective to the other side of what Stanley liked about who could be under the mask. The alter ego, so to speak, of Stan's thesis, as it's written by one of those kids who identified with Spider-Man despite not being from the same background. Quote, Spider-Man has always been everyman hero. Peter Parker is not a god like Thor, an alien like Superman, a time displaced soldier like Captain America, a deadly spy like the Black Widow, and certainly not a billionaire like Iron Man or Batman. He's a bright, if slightly awkward kid from a very modest background. When we meet him, his biggest problems are trying to balance school, family, work, and still figure out his social life. Even when he becomes Spider-Man, all those problems are still there. They just get complicated to an incredible degree. And that was me as a kid, even though I don't look anything like him. My parents moved to the U.S. from India in the 1970s, and I was the first in my family to be born as an American. It was an interesting and often challenging experience growing up and straddling two worlds. I was on my own, figuring out this dual identity, trying to fit in both at school and at home, with neither world quite understanding the other. It was a lot of pressure and often lonely. Peter Parker was also on his own, trying to balance two lives and somehow make them both work. He didn't seem particularly depressed about being in this position, but it's not like he particularly enjoyed it either. He just got on with it because that's what the good guys do. You do the right thing even when it's tough because you can and should, and not for credit or glory. I admired and aspired to that. Out of all the superheroes that I enjoyed, Peter Parker always seemed the most real. These qualities are in no way defined by racial background and are not unique to any one ethnicity. So why couldn't the next big screen version of Peter Benjamin Parker be, you know, not white. 
Spider-Man's everyman-ness is important to his depiction because it allows for such a broad appeal and people to better identify with him, in the Marvel tradition of more flawed, relatable heroes. But what about some of the other things mentioned in that blog post, like doing the right thing even when it's tough? It's not just the struggles that make Spider-Man a hero, but the choices he makes. Because under the mask, Peter Parker has always been a good person. In keeping with the appeal Spider-Man had with kids, Stan made Peter Parker someone with a strong moral compass, who lived up to virtues like self-sacrifice. In the very first story of Spider-Man, he is shown shirking his responsibility to take action during a robbery, which leads to his Uncle Ben dying. It's a classic scene, now redone countless times in countless ways, but the message remains the same. With great power comes great responsibility. Even in the early comics by Stan, this becomes a steadfast guide for Peter as a character. The realization that because of the power he holds, he has a responsibility to stand up against injustice in any way he can. Remember when Stan talked about giving characters flaws that make them more realistic? Well, Peter Parker is a great example. He is a fantastic hero because he has a big heart, and it sometimes leads him to trust people when he shouldn't. He wants to see the good in people for who they are and the good they can do. Even with his flaws like naivety, he still wants to see the good in those around him, even people like villains. Peter Parker has empathy for people and things totally different than he is, somewhat fitting for a skinny straight guy from Queens to seemingly embody the same spirit Stanley approached the world with, at least in his writing. Yet, despite his big heart, he also never gives up and always seems to keep fighting when the odds are stacked against him. The most famous and gripping Spider-Man stories pull at these ideas, seeming to stretch Spider-Man to a breaking point, but he always snaps back. Ideas like, what if the kind-hearted Peter Parker could somehow be corrupted? What happens when he's pulled to the limit and can't handle the stress of balancing his life as a hero and a regular person? Concepts like these are the basis for some of the most iconic stories in comics and some pretty great moments in film. But in the end, Spidey always perseveres because he, as a character, is a good person. He always makes the hard choice to get up and keep fighting because it's the right thing to do. Behind all the high-flying spandex theatrics is the lesson that has made Spider-Man an icon to people of all ages and backgrounds for over half a century. The lesson is your power doesn't make you a hero. Your choices do. He doesn't accept collateral damage or unavoidable losses. He doesn't kill his enemies because to a character with the great power of Peter Parker, he knows he has the responsibility to make the harder choice. On that note, I want to talk personally about one of my favorite Spider-Man moments, Aunt May's speech from Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2. Spider-Man 2 adapts the Spider-Man No More comic arc, which sees Peter quit the mantle of Spider-Man after not being able to balance his personal life with the weight of the world he takes on as a superhero. Raimi's Spider-Man 2 has become a beloved classic of the superhero genre, and while that is surely deserved for the creative cinematography, fantastic casting and performances, and the still great special effects, for me personally, it comes down to scenes like this that get at the nature of why Spider-Man as character has remained resonant for so many decades. It's a perfectly crafted moment brought to life with Rosemary Harris's subdued performance as Aunt May. It's a realization to Peter at his lowest point that his choices are bigger than himself and the things he has the power to do affect the world around him. It's not just that he has the power to do the right thing but a responsibility to use that power, even if it's the hard path to walk. This revelation inspires him, of course, to win the day in grand Hollywood fashion, and that's all well and good. But when people talk about why Spider-Man 2 is such a great movie, it's this moment of quiet contemplation I think about. Because at the end of the day, part of the amazing fantasy of Spider-Man is that he can embody the best of what we want to be as people. And when he gets knocked down, gets up and keeps going. It's nice to think about in a world of endlessly cynical entertainment and brooding anti-heroes. Peter Parker has always been a little bit nicer. That's not to say his stories have never been dark or gone dark places, but Spider-Man as a character seems to have stood the test of time by acknowledging no matter how dark it gets, there's always some light out there to fight for. And through all the years and changes for the webhead, these aspects have been foundational to the character and his many, many interpretations. Spider-Man is just a regular guy from New York who deals with the same human problems that everyone else does, but chooses to keep going. A flawed character that most people, regardless of gender or ethnicity, 
can identify with on some level. Now, you might say, but Spider-Man 2 is different because it's shoving diversity and woke modern politics into the story. And I'm here to tell you, Spider-Man always has. I'll link a video down below from the channel Moth's Audio and Video that discusses the beloved 1990s animated series and how it tackled a variety of tough subjects, including depictions of police racism and plenty more. It's a really great video and shines some light on important, though overlooked themes of one of the most popular Spider-Man adaptations. And it currently has less than a thousand views, so go support that channel if you wouldn't mind. But even in comics, there have been a slew of political issues tackled directly in the pages of the main Amazing Spider-Man series. In The Amazing Spider-Man number 68, published in 1969, nice, the Kingpin frames a group of protesters advocating for better campus housing. The entire comic is rife with political overtones and not so subtle references to Black Panther style racial politics of the 1960s. And not in a bad way. Look at this dialogue talking about the white man's world. This is classic Spidey being political explicitly in 1969. It presents complicated and nuanced questions around the protests and who's right or wrong. How much force is justified when cries for help are ignored and ends with the protesters getting their demands met from the college when the art concludes, aided by Spidey who uncovered Kingpin's plot to frame them. In issue number 70, we see the appearance of Hobie Brown, the first incarnation of the Prowler, who Spidey originally misjudges as a villain. Some subtext here being that Hobie is black and possibly framed for a crime he didn't commit. Issue 96 explicitly addresses drugs affecting black communities more than white ones and the role wealth inequality plays in that. Issue 99 sees Spidey de-escalating a prison riot when a protest for better living conditions is overtaken by bad faith actors who want to break free, and a black man is framed as the culprit until Spidey uncovers the truth. And the warden also calls for prison reform and more funding, something depressingly still needed today. In ASM 117, we see Spidey uncover a conspiracy around a politician who's simply saying what's popular to get elected and gain power. In other series like Peter Parker's Spectacular Spider-Man issue 9 from 1977, we see Spidey side with a protest over college cutting night school classes, showing a lack of educational opportunities as an issue that affects working people who want an education that keeps them from advancing in life, and even acknowledging that the college can afford police to guard protesters but not provide classes. I also don't think it's an accident that among these, black students are prominently featured. Then there's Spectacular Spider-Man issue 71 from 1982, which tackles gun control, with Peter saying a robber didn't deserve to die and holding some really tough conversations about what would change gun violence in a city like New York. And I can't imagine anyone reading this and coming away thinking Spider-Man as a character is pro-gun. Granted, these are just a few examples, but already they reflect a lot of what we've seen in Spidey's foundations. Empathy, a desire to not simply judge on the face of an issue, but find the truth for yourself, an understanding of others' differences, and also advocating for those who might not have the resources to do it for themselves. While politics have never been an explicit focus of Spider-Man's adventures, it's blatantly wrong to say he's never been political. He has, and has always sided seemingly with progressive values. Peter Parker is the opposite of a blue-haired SJW caricature people like to conjure up when they talk about woke characters and identity politics. He's the most basic white bread dude imaginable, but he still stands up for what's right, still respects others, and isn't prejudiced against them based on color or creed. Peter Parker is woke. He is accepting of diversity and people of different backgrounds. Now, whenever Stan Lee comes up in relation to Spider-Man and progressive themes, people like to bring up this interview where Stan says, Peter Parker shouldn't be gay or black. However, Stan isn't saying that Spider-Man shouldn't be gay or black. He's saying that Peter Parker unto himself is a character with a developed identity, and he believes that shouldn't be changed. Those same people tend to forget that Lee vouched for Donald Glover to play Spider-Man in the movies as far back as 2010, and let's not forget what he said before. As you probably know if you're watching this, Peter Parker isn't the only Spider-Man. Or, I guess I should say, Spider-Person. Many of the Marvel writers have taken Stan's words to heart about Peter being his own character, and so invented plenty of new spins on the web-slinger in the last few decades. Most important to this conversation is Miles Morales, a mixed-race teen living in Brooklyn who took on the name Spider-Man in the Ultimate Comics timeline after Peter Parker died fighting the Green Goblin, but that's a story for a little later. 
Some of these spun off from the original Spider-Verse comic event, like Ghost Spider or Spider-Gwen if you prefer, a version of Gwen Stacy who became her universe's Spider-Person instead of Peter. Others go back even farther, like Miguel O'Hara, also known as Spider-Man 2099 from the mid-90s-ish cyberpunky run of Marvel stories. Then there's my love and darling Cooper Cohen, aka Web Weaver, who absolutely served in the few issues he's been in and is an icon, so where the hell is my Web Weaver suit, Insomniac? Of course, these alternate versions of Spidey have become more popular in the mainstream with various appearances in video games and the Amazing Spider-Verse film, so characters like Miles Morales and Spider-Gwen are more well-known now than ever before. And Web Weaver would be too if you just put him in a Spider-Verse film like he deserves. A lot of critics like to say these characters are pandering for diversity points or are trying to replace Spider-Man because he's a straight white man, but that's just not the case. In most of their incarnations, characters like Gwen, Miles, Silk, Jessica Drew, and plenty more have their own struggles, lives, enemies, and personalities, and flaws that set them entirely apart from Peter. I will talk about Mons Morales, his reception, and the angry internet nerds who like to spout that he's a diversity replacement for Peter Parker in a bit, because like I mentioned, there are a lot of things we can discuss as it relates to Spider-Man's inherent wokeness. And Miles, I feel, is where that conversation really reaches its apex. But first, let's do a quick recap. Marvel has always had a diverse readership, and always endeavored to be inclusive and stand against bigotry. Spider-Man has always had explicitly political stories across a variety of incarnations, and always sides against bigotry and racism. Spider-Man is a character who is broadly popular because of his wide appeal and the fact that he is, at his core, a good person who will always do what he can to make the right choice, even if it's the hard one. And not only does Spidey have a long history of appealing to a wide variety of demographics, but those demographics have also been represented by a variety of spider people over the years. And the real reason I wanted to lay all this groundwork up front is so that we can actually get to the criticism of Spider-Man 2, Insomniac's recently released game. Well, I say criticism, but you might be able to tell that what I mean isn't a structured critique that tears at narrative inconsistencies or themes or issues with gameplay like bugs. Criticism like that is generally subjective and can be absolutely warranted. No, I mean the criticism that a wide assortment of the usual suspects have attached to Spider-Man 2 so they can push the idea that it's somehow a train wreck because of wokeness, and the idea that Spider-Man is being ruined by wokeness, or that the writers hate Spider-Man. So as we go into this next section, keep in mind the character's history, his wide appeal, his creators advocating for social justice, and Peter Parker's steadfast sense of right, which includes helping those in need. But for now, let's actually listen and see what makes Spider-Man 2, in the eloquent words of Synthetic Man, disgusting woke propaganda. I've talked in the past about how YouTubers like Synthetic Man and The Quartering often go into a piece of media looking to rage at it with preconceived notions in mind. Again, if you want to hear all about the grifting sphere of dorks who unironically say things like go woke, go broke, go check out this video, Everything is Woke, which I will link down below. So let's get the broad strokes of the game's wokeness out of the way first. What are people complaining about being woke in a Spider-Man game? To get to the bottom of what so many people seem to be saying, I did what I do best and watched hours of videos from a variety of creators, and I found that by and large, the people driving the conversation around Spider-Man 2 being woke, creating videos that sometimes get upwards of half a million views, don't seem to really know Spider-Man that well. That's not to say I'm trying to like reverse gatekeep or anything. I don't really care if this is somebody's first experience with Spider-Man. I only bring familiarity up because so many of these arguments seem drawn from nostalgia or just a desire to pander to a base without really stopping to think about how much their complaints do or don't align with Spider-Man as a character, or Marvel as a whole. On the subject of pandering to a base without knowing what the hell you're talking about, let's look at what Lauren Chen says as a little warm-up. Spider-Man, sadly, has fallen prey to these woke zombies. And I guess one of the biggest red flags for fans of Spider-Man was the replacement of Peter Parker with Miles Morales. One of the side quests in the Miles Morales Spider-Man game actually involves helping a classmate, a male classmate, propose to another male classmate. You're just a long ways away from when Spider-Man used to be about like delivering pizzas. Ah uh, yes, Spider-Man has 
fallen prey to those woke zombies, I can tell you are very familiar with the modern brand and not just rage baiting engagement. Now that we've all had a good laugh, let's get to the main criticisms of why Spider-Man 2 is the latest woke scourge trying to take gaming away from straight white men. I want to be clear up front that while I think Insomniac did a pretty good job with representation in this game, it's also representation in only the most basic sense of the word. As in, gay people are represented because two character models hold hands. It's basically a reminder that gay people or black people exist, and that's about it. Because of things like this, Spider-Man 2 is a good reminder that even when massively consumed art is made by people with their heart in the right place, there's likely not going to be representation that feels authentic. Because this piece of media is made to appeal to as many as possible, it's never going to go too far in any specific cultural direction. That's fine, that's the nature of modern big budget art. But it also means that you shouldn't go into a game like this expecting a reflection of the gay experience. Now, at least until Insomniac gets it together and makes a full Web Weaver spinoff because there is something I'd want represented in my gay experience. Oh my gosh, hi. Hi, Cooper. Until then, I always recommend seeking out independent art made by marginalist creators, particularly in independent game spaces like itch.io and independent filmmakers and authors. Now, is this tiny road sign that says gay is ahead making a massive political statement in this game? Not really. There's nothing in the game that really tackles contentious issues like the ongoing fight for trans rights and LGBTQ rights that are under attack in America, or issues with racism against people of color, including police brutality. Again, I don't think it's necessarily even fair to expect these heavy issues to be reflected in just a broad product because I wouldn't trust something seeking such broad appeal to take a firm stance on any side of these contentious issues. However, that hasn't stopped people from acting like merely showing people of different color or sexuality is a sign of impending apocalypse. Many content creators have accused the game of pandering to ESG, and even worse, being disingenuous with their representation and diversity because the game has been censored in the Middle East. Well, I want everybody who is part of that community, I want them to know, please understand this, the developer does not care about you, and they will literally erase gay people to make more money. Here's the example. It's confirmed. Spider-Man 2 Middle East version has removed LGBT dialogues, side missions, and all gender spectrum flags. Are you going to insult me too? Or accept that the corporation sees your identity as pure money? This is a talking point that gets regurgitated a lot, but the same folks can't decide if the devs put queer rep and strong female characters in there as self-inserts, so which is it? Do they care because they have a personal investment and need to spread propaganda, or do they not care because their parent company makes a money decision? Once you've wrapped your noodle around that doodle, consider this complaint is a great way to tell how much somebody knows about game development in general. Do you think the same people on the writing team, or the people in charge of making diverse murals, or animating and programming side missions with gay couples, are the same people making the calls at Sony? Insomniac Games has over 500 employees if LinkedIn is anything to go by. And that's not even counting the other studios who help out with various aspects. So what's more believable, a 500 person conspiracy to cheat these stupid Wokies out of their coin, or when Sony releases their one big budget flagship title a year, they cut some content so they can make money elsewhere. Because they're not the same people. I'm willing to bet that the people who worked hard on that content did so with the knowledge that it would be cut but they put it in anyway because they thought that was important, you know, to see themselves or other people represented because of tolerance and diversity. Aside from that, there are plenty of other content creators who seem to just levy the accusation that the game is pandering, and that is a point of criticism in and of itself. How Insomniac has filled Spider-Man 2 to the brim with pandering, to the point that it feels like it overshadows other key features. And they clearly care more about pushing their progressive politics and they do about telling a good story. They're pushing something here, but it's not in the main story. If you just blow through the main story and you play the main story, there is zero woke stuff in the main story. So what are these great woke complaints? Let's start with a timeless classic that will always get angry nerds, sharing toys with girls. And I want to give a warning that here is where we get into some real big spoiler territory. So if that's not your bag, come back or skip ahead, I'll denote some timestamps in the description below.
oh boy, do these people have issues with MJ? And most of them just revolve around calling her ugly. Say what you want about Mary Jane being ugly. Yeah, she looks hideous. It's absolutely fugly, all right? I'm sorry. It's quite obvious they intentionally tried their hardest to make her look like a dude. Her chin is sharper than Quagmire's from Family Guy. At no point in this game does she resemble a female. Now, you might think to yourself, even if she's not the most attractive character model, how is that pushing an ideological agenda? Ah, you fool, you see it because it's depriving them of a fictional character they can find attractive. There is no other explanation for this except that the writers hate Peter Parker and they hate Peter Parker's fans. All the self-insert nerd people who Spider-Man was literally made for. That's why he's one of the most popular superhero characters ever since his creation, is because he is the perfect self-insert for the nerds who are reading comic books. And so Peter Parker's life is shit, man. So many bad things happen to him. It is a running trope across all of his comic book series. And so what did they do? They gave him a supermodel girlfriend so that he has one thing in his life, one good thing to keep him going so he doesn't just blow his f***ing brains out. And what do they do in the games? They take that away from him by making her a f***ing 50-year-old man-jawed This This is what also ruins the game. For some reason, they switched... MJ's facial um, uh, model with some other girl. I mean, if you even remember the old one, the old one wasn't even that good looking either, but at least it wasn't this. <laughs> you know what I mean? And of course, of course, of course, this is the modern age we live in where women can't be beautiful. Women has to be ugly. There's no such thing as beautiful women at all. It's like Insomniac never met any beautiful women. Of course they don't. I'm sure the women that worked at Insomniac, they all f butt ugly. No type of, you know, facial features. Probably subhumans, but of course they will create something like this. There's this conspiracy that one writer is responsible for directly writing MJ and influencing her appearance, but there's literally no proof aside from a very passing resemblance. Like, they don't even really look alike. And she wasn't the only writer on the game, it had a whole writing team, but that hasn't stopped people from openly harassing this woman when they don't even know what she did on that team. But more than just her appearance, people are mad that Insomniac didn't take criticism that nobody wanted to play as Mary Jane, and they're pushing their agenda by forcing others to play as somebody with no powers. Or more accurately, a lot of people are getting mad at realism in a game with Spider-Man, because in the game's cell sequences, she takes down a few trained soldiers. Spoilers ahead for another point of contention, a late game boss fight. Skip ahead to avoid spoilers, you've been warned. There's also a lot of complaining centering on a late game boss fight after MJ is taken over by a symbiote and becomes Scream, a fan favorite symbiote from the comics. No, the complaints aren't about the inaccuracy of MJ becoming Scream, but what she says to Peter. After Peter is a dick to everyone, pushing them away under the influence of the Venom symbiote, when MJ says what's on her mind, it's kind of hurtful to Peter. Or you could call it a feminist rant because the game is considering the feelings of a woman for like one second. And we get the most blatant, transparent, feminist rant I think I've ever heard in a video game. Guns begging for validation from you, from anyone. Validation? Ah. If this is about your job. It's about me. Yay! Oh my God. Typical woman, me, me, me. Mary Jane is obviously the self-insert of the lead writer for this game, and this rant must be directed toward her ex-boyfriends or some shit, because this is some of the most out-of-touch, narcissistic bullshit I think I've heard in any piece of entertainment. The whole thing about the symbiote is that it's portrayed like an addiction. It makes you feel more powerful, less inhibited, makes you say things you wouldn't otherwise, kind of like here, where MJ's insecurities are laid bare and she is literally lashing out at Peter because of it. Again, a very classic Marvel character who is by no means being depicted as perfect. Here we see her flaws, and Peter Parker, in classic big-hearted fashion, opens up to her in return because he loves her. On that note, when do you think the last time Synthetic Man felt the touch of a woman he didn't have to pay half up front for? Because it's focusing on a woman for a second, it's narcissism. Despite her talking openly about her feelings and talking out her relationship with Peter, which I can't stress enough is not how narcissists operate. So MJ is too strong, 
despite not being that strong, and has feelings, which means this game is woke. But that is far from the only thing getting criticized here, so buckle up, Buttercup. In the game, you take on a variety of side missions as either Miles or Peter and help people at Miles School or just throughout the city in a variety of low stakes, innocuous tasks. The same kind Spider-Man has been doing across films, TV shows, comics, and games for decades now. But these ones are bad because some of the people you help are gay. And did have sprinkles of wokeness was there's a gay couple and he helps this gay guy ask his boyfriend to homecoming. <laughs> thoughts? Special. Thoughts, chat? You even have a side mission where you have to help a student ask his boyfriend to prom. And it's not even that the pandering is whatever. It's also that Miles' missions are mostly just annoying in terms of how you do them. You know, when people buy a Spider-Man game, they're totally expecting the side activities to include uh, getting a gay couple to go to prom together. Yes, that's, that's exactly what people paid to play. Yes, of course, what people really want are missions where you don't play as Spider-Man and play as a powerless person. And because these people like to see literally anything different as cringe, they had a field day with one side mission in particular, starring Miles' crush and love interest Haley, who is deaf. The mission is actually a nice change of pace. It's brief and uses emojis instead of subtitles to change up gameplay a bit to suit the way Haley experiences the world. Like Spider-Man himself, it's an experience all about empathizing with a different point of view. So naturally, this crowd hated it. Miles' girlfriend is deaf. <laughs> Miles' girlfriend has a deaf girlfriend in the game. Are you serious? Nothing wrong with him dating a deaf girl. You know, if he wants to date a deaf girl, that's fine. I'm, I don't really fucking care. But it's the fact that the game forces you to play as her. What? What is this? Come on. Riveting. <laughs> I got so annoyed and pissed off during this mission. What is the point of this, Can Man? I have no clue. Like, if you're like, we really want to target the, the inner city black deaf girl demographic, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and by the way, they also need to own a PlayStation 5, and they also need to be really into Spider-Man. And that, yeah. that's, that's who this segment is for, you know? Yeah. If you ever want to really see performative outrage, Geeks and Gamers is what it really looks like. A group of adults acting their best to laugh and disparage about things that aren't even worth getting mad about. But they've got to pander to their base so they can say things are woke, like having a deaf person in a video game. It's this kind of criticism that's based on the idea that because it's not your personal experience with the world, whoever's experience it is doesn't matter. But that's not how the people who make this character see the world. It never has been. And then we get to the team up gay slash woman combo complaint. Felicia Hardy, aka Black Cat, a former lover slash rival slash anti-hero who makes a brief appearance in Spider-Man 2, where she mentions needing to get to Paris to help her girlfriend. Now, it's important to note that Black Cat is bisexual, and has been since at least 2001, where this issue in a limited solo series hinted at intimacy with women. Black Cat has always been something of a femme fatale stereotype, and definitely follows in Catwoman's paw prints, which means so many dudes are horny for this fictional character. Apparently now she's a lesbian and she uses the scroll to teleport to Paris so she can get with her girlfriend. Are you f***ing joking? I mean shit, in the 90s cartoon, which was for children, they made sure to make Black Cat hot as f***. And so, you know what? This isn't just a slight against Peter Parker. This is a slight against me specifically you insomniac and f anybody who praises encourages or even is just okay with ugly art because that's exactly what this game is it's disgusting demoralizing propaganda trash all that because a character had a girlfriend and he wanted to f the cartoon version more i need to stress that if any of these people played the first game and the dlc they know that black cat is not just gay because her having sex with Peter and possibly having a baby is a major plot point. They could have looked it up in a Wikipedia summary. But no, better just get mad at lesbians. They already have to deal with Ariel Scarcella. Haven't they been put through enough? But what about Miles, the black Spider-Man? There's the complaint that Miles, in taking a more prominent role in this game, is meant to replace Peter. This has to do primarily with a few late game scenes, so spoilers apply here as well. For much of the game, Peter struggles to balance his spider life, with an old friend returning, a chance to follow his science dreams and do some good, and his newly recovered relationship with MJ. He's also still personally reeling from the death of Aunt May. Miles deals with his own issues through the story, which we will get to. 
but already any Fairweather webhead fan would see how this strain and stress to balance power and responsibility is perfectly in line with Spidey. Throw Venom in the mix and the third act gets a little off the rails. But in the end, Venom is dealt with and Peter decides to take a break from being Spider-Man, not quitting the mantle, but passing it on to Miles, who is still young and has proven himself not only physically capable, but most importantly, able to make the hard choices Peter has represented as Spider-Man. It's a touching passing of the torch that shows a lot of reverence for both of these characters in their journeys, while allowing them both to move on to new phases in their lives. It's one of the big lessons in the game, as Pete relies on Miles and MJ to help him fight off his literal personal demons, that even with power and responsibility, you don't have to fight every battle alone. The advertising tagline of the game is literally be greater together. I don't know how it could be any clearer. Peter doesn't need to be the only protector of New York anymore, and he wants to move into a new phase of adulthood, pursuing his passion for science and possibly starting a family with Mary Jane. It's a great move for the character. So what do these people think about it? And then we get yet another fucking terrible scene where Peter takes a break from being Spider-Man to be Peter Parker. Now, some people have interpreted this as him retiring and Miles taking up the mantle, but you and me both know that Spider-Man 3 would and bomb, much like Miles Morales did, if Miles was now permanently Spider-Man. So of course Peter's gonna come out of retirement in the next one, but it still is cringe as fuck because it wasn't enough to have a minority Spider-Man, we now also need a woman Spider-Man. In fact, just fucking kill Peter Parker already. I'm tired of this bullshit. This story fucking sucks. It is, I don't like playing as Miles Morales. I don't like going back and forth between Peter Parker and Miles Morales. I just want to play as Spider-Man. Why? I don't want yeah. to play as Miles Morales. You may already be aware of the Miles is Miles, not Spider-Man thing. Hold your spider horses, we will get to it. There's so much to talk about with Miles that he gets his own section, but first we need to see the best or maybe worst examples of these complaints. And that's from YouTuber Synthetic Man. Because while these complaints from culture war ideologues pushing for views and grifting to make people angry about non-issues like white characters being replaced or gay people being in media are pretty obviously ridiculous and flimsy criticisms on the surface, under that surface is a deeper issue that pervades modern media consumption. Something that isn't just limited to Marvel or Spider-Man or superheroes. If the video from Synthetic Man shows anything, it's that the people who complain the most about franchises being ruined by wokeness probably never understood those franchises to begin with because if they did they would know they're the villains of the story at an hour and 20 minutes synthetic man's review of spider-man 2 leads the pack in views it's a Incredibly poorly crafted series of minor complaints at literally everything he could find. Even things I totally missed, like a small non-binary cup in an office desk. It's the definition of looking for things to get mad at, to the point I'm genuinely amazed he can get out of bed in the morning without blowing a blood vessel at something completely inconsequential. And while he does complain about most of the things I've already covered, his complaints extend to even the most benign things that he can only seem to express criticism of by being racist, sexist, or otherwise just... A garbage person. I won't go over his whole video, but I want to bring up the flaws in some of his broader points because it's a great example of how somebody misses the point so terribly of a piece of media that they become the villain, the antithesis of everything their hero would stand for. Synthetic Man, like so many others, repeating these talking points about how Spider-Man is woke, identifies himself as a Spider-Man fan, but if you listen to more of his complaints, really think about how closely he aligns with the heroic ideal Peter Parker has always represented. Think about if Peter Parker himself would react the same way to these things. Now, for Synthetic Man's part, there's just a lot of anger and stupid things that I won't get into too much. For example, he said that the Insomniac that made Ratchet and Clank isn't the same Insomniac of today. And Insomniac is nothing like the company that made those games. It's happened to pretty much every video game studio that was big in the late 90s and early 2000s. Even though... Insomniac put out a Ratchet & Clank game literally last year. His video is filled with these kind of pedantic points that just fizzle away if you think about him for half a second. But what about the political points? When I mention he complains about anything, I mean anything. 
And none of his complaints about the world or story can come down to a matter of personal taste. It needs to be assured evidence of wokeness. For example, near the beginning of the game, where he brings up Yuri, a returning character, and says she's yet another character made into a strong female character by embodying toxic masculinity, as he claims out of nowhere. She acts like a try-hard edgelord, another case of a strong female character basically just embodying toxic masculinity traits. Another woman claimed by giving women the role of men, it must be wokeness. Even though she literally doesn't have anything about her that's really that masculine, like she's even rocking a feminine haircut still. However, moments like these, while common in the video, only serve to underline how little he actually knows about a subject, like Yuri going off the deep end and becoming a ventral vigilante, being a focal point of the first game's DLC, which anyone who read the comics would know is a stepping stone to her becoming the vigilante Wraith. Again, you could just read a Wikipedia article. This is interesting to note, because throughout, Synthetic Man claims he was a Spider-Man fan. He grew up reading the comics, he loved the Saturday morning cartoon. But knowing everything we know about Spider-Man, about his sense of justice and sticking up for others, Hell, even how the animated series itself tackled some intense social issues. To say nothing of the comics, do you think Synthetic Man ever actually engaged with anything about Spider-Man beyond the spectacular stunts and wild web swinging? For example, let's look at his complaints of the in-game Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man app. In the game, the app is the catalyst for most side missions, taking the classic Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man moniker and putting a fun spin on it. While much of the game is full of explosive set pieces and world-threatening villains, the Friendly Spider-Man app is a way to have players get back to Spidey's roots, to help civilians with missions that aren't high stakes or action-packed. The kind of thing, again, Spidey has been doing his entire career. It's what makes him a street-level hero. Also, they're entirely optional. With Spidey's sense of civic responsibility in mind, listen to how he talks about these side missions. In particular, notice the way he has to label literally every person based on their race and or gender. He decides to help randos who have some kind of trivial issue they could easily solve themselves. For example, you help some black woman find her grandpa who's gotten lost in Central Park or something, but it gets much worse than that. There's another quest where you help some old black guy free his pigeons. And of course you give the robot dog to the lady, which has a rainbow painted on it for some reason this whole game's like that that's just the tip of the iceberg for that shit oh but it gets worse it gets much much worse it should be noted that his complaints aren't with the game itself but that he finds these side quests which are clearly delineated as slower and more wholesome missions as boring less because of gameplay than subject matter like here's him complaining about a little rainbow decal because rainbows can't just be a cute decoration anymore i guess like, it's just a rainbow. It's not political. You're making it political. Or how he calls this teenager a Zoomer mutt. There's another mission where you go to Miles' private school and help some Zoomer mutt who I couldn't even tell was a woman until I looked closely. That he couldn't tell if she was male or female. If it wasn't clear by now, there's nothing wrong with these people. There's no reason to call a light-skinned person a mutt unless it's to dehumanize them, which is exactly what he thinks is okay. Oh, and when I said he complains about anything, I mean anything. Like when he questions why women of color are in Craven's hunting clan. Why does he have so many badass hunters that are full of women and people of color? I mean, this is the most diverse group of villains I've ever seen in any video game. Because only white people hunt, apparently? Inspired by the game I finally read, uh, the iconic comic run Craven's Last Hunt, I found that Craven's entourage has literally always been diverse, at least as far back as the 80s, so this is also just being accurate to the comics. We have another huge woke moment as one of Craven's hunters, who's a whammon, beats another, and we get to see yet another huge woke moment. And everyone just thinks this is okay, this is fine. This totally means nothing. Your lying eyes, your pattern recognition, that's just schizo shit. I was seriously disgusted when I saw this, and it doesn't help that most of this mission is yet another walking simulator mission. I need to be clear that he thinks this is pandering propaganda because a woman in a clan of unhinged militia-type hunters is beating the shit out of a man. It's unrealistic to him in a game about men with spider powers. This guy, who looks like a light breeze, could cause him debilitating harm. Would you want to get in the ring with a female MMA champ? 
You think you could take him? But for Synthetic Man, a self-professed Spider-Man fan and who loves Peter, much of his complaints come down to how Peter is treated in the story. Or more accurately, he is mad at how Peter is treated after being under the influence of the symbiote suit. For example, he's mad that Peter apologizes to Mile and MJ when he gets the suit off. Any of this behavior, any of his actions were his fault when he was being mind controlled. Like we've mentioned, the thing with Venom is that it brings out the worst in people. I actually think it's best to think of Venom as an addiction since actor Yuri Lowenthal even based his performance on depictions of drug addicts. It's another thing that takes over the mind and makes people do things they wouldn't do, pushing away and isolating their friends and loved ones. And much like a recovering addict, Peter's road to recovery includes apologizing. It's another classic Marvel move, taking something fantastical, like being controlled by an alien goo monster, but through character interaction and storytelling, turning it into an analog for something more realistic and relatable, like addiction and recovery. This is pure, classic Spidey, doing the hard thing, getting knocked down and back up again, struggling with things that anyone can struggle with. While noticing how much he criticized things that just seemed like regular Spider-Man, I couldn't help but notice Synthetic Man has an odd predilection for wanting more murder in this T-rated game. It's the only way he can seem to envision clear stakes in a story. He says multiple times that characters like Miles should have killed his father's killer, or Peter should have lost control of the symbiote and killed someone. Miles shouldn't have stopped Peter from killing Craven. Peter should have chosen to let Harry die. The list goes on. But just as Spider-Man might kill Craven, now notice how I say might, because he hasn't even knocked Craven unconscious. That's an important plot point here. He's still choking him out as Miles shows up and attacks Peter to stop him from killing Craven. And again, it robs Peter Parker of a great character development moment he could have had. Miles decides obviously not to kill him, which I think is definitely the wrong move. It's way too boring. It's yet another thing that makes Miles way too similar to Peter. When it comes to killing, he thinks Miles not killing is proof of him not standing as his own character. He, I want to say willfully, doesn't see how Miles is different from Peter either, and also just completely ignores how this unwillingness to compromise himself allows Miles to live up to the aspirational standards of Spider-Man. And we're given an actually interesting ethical dilemma. Dr. Connors tells Peter that he has to kill Harry to stop Venom, whereas Norman Osborn wants him to save his son. Unfortunately, because this is a modern superhero story, Spider-Man doesn't consider killing Harry for even a second, so it's not really a real moral dilemma, but we almost had something interesting there. He says we don't get a real moral dilemma because Parker doesn't consider killing his friend. What he fails to realize here is that Peter has already resolved the moral dilemma. That's the moral dilemma. That's why he's a hero, because he won't make the easy choice. He's not going to sit aside and let his friend die. He's Spider-Man. He's going to save his friend or die trying. If it's not clear by now, despite wanting to appear like he's fighting for the original character, Synthetic Man and people like him don't actually seem to get what Peter is about. They understand the concept of power, of being superhuman and doing cool fights and swinging, but not the idea of responsibility. Despite it being a fairly simple lesson for even children to learn, Instead, they'd rather complain about things like Peter being replaced because the writers of the game hate Spider-Man, apparently. Now all of you can stop coping, seething, and dilating, claiming that Marvel's not trying to replace Peter Parker since he's a straight white male. Insomniac just straight up told you that Miles should replace Peter because he's better in every way, and he's also an oppressed minority, and he's very cultured. This is the writers saying, you to the audience and that they hate Spider-Man. People who hate Spider-Man were put in charge of writing a Spider-Man story. You know, kind of just like comic books over the past like 15 years. And you might look at his whole video and think, why did you spend a whole segment focusing on one loser chud YouTuber? And it's not because I was personally rankled by Synthetic Man. It's because the points he pushes here are the exact kind that are pushed every day by people who claim they're fans and not just of Spider-Man, but really anything. People like Synthetic Man want to claim something for themselves, but they can only really lash out in anger at every modern incarnation because it was never really for them. Sure, he might have had fond memories of the animated series, but if those same stories came out today, he'd call them SJW pandering garbage. As the tide of media becomes more progressive and series that have always embraced those values 
make those themes more obvious, they have to be outraged. If not at the people ruining their toys, then at themselves for not realizing the thing they claimed to love was always that way. It's the same story again from franchises like Star Trek and Doctor Who, who have always pushed inclusivity and social justice, yet consistently find themselves with people arguing that new Star Trek is woke, as if it hasn't always been that way. On, my beloved old friend. <laughs> I'm Judzia now. Uh, well, Judzia, my beloved old friend. He wants to say that people who hate Spider-Man have been put in charge of this game, but the truth is that he's seemingly the one that hates Spider-Man. He hates inclusivity. He hates helping the little guy. He hates the struggles and methods of the character that have been essential since his inception. Instead, he craves more violence and death for the sake of drama, but doesn't actually care about what nearly any other character except the straight white guy he's imprinted on has to say or do. He wants spectacle, but not any depth, unless it appeals directly to him specifically. He's selfish and narrow-minded. If he were a character in a Spider-Man story, he'd be the villain, standing against everything the righteous hero stands for. People like Synthetic Man lack the self-awareness to see they're not the good guy. Are we the baddies? And that's why I think they react so negatively to media when it depicts empathy, diversity, and understanding. They don't really understand that one of the truest aspects of Spider-Man, any Spider-Man, has been the divide between power and responsibility. See, everybody wants power. They want the fantasy of swinging webs and punching bad guys, but the rest of it? Nah. The thing is, that call to action upon the altar of self-sacrifice, the heroic ideal of having power and using it sparingly, selflessly, is what makes Spider-Man Spider-Man. And despite what people like Synthetic Man, Lauren Chen, Geeks and Gamers, or whoever else want to say, it's that same spirit of sacrifice and selflessness that makes Miles Morales Spider-Man. The reason I haven't talked much yet about Miles is because he is a much bigger part of this game and the conversation around Spider-Man. At least, certainly a bigger part than just a sidekick. Because Miles Morales isn't Peter Parker, but Miles Morales is Spider-Man. And for some reason, these folks seem to hate that. A lot of people like to cover their complaints by saying, I'm not racist, Miles is just a replacement, he's not his own character, he's naturally better than Peter, or any other number of desperate complaints repeated from whoever they saw get mad at woke game on YouTube. The problem with so many of these complaints is that they've been proven false time and time again across comics, films, and games. But the same people have also been literally repeating them since Miles' first appearance in 2011. Like, quite literally. When Miles was introduced, there was an outpouring of support for the new Ultimate Spider-Man. Peter's story in the rebooted Ultimate Universe, which is different than the main Marvel continuity, I won't get into that right now, it had run its course though. He died valiantly at the hands of his arch nemesis, the Green Goblin, saving his family. And from that faithful first appearance, Miles had some big shoes to fill. And in the first few issues after, the mailbag section was full of people voicing concerns about Miles being a diversity replacement, that Peter had been killed off for no real reason, instead of understanding just like how stories work. Many of Miles' first stories focused entirely on his sense of self-identity and doubt as a kid trying to live up to the mantle of Spider-Man. It wasn't just himself doing the doubting either, but the rest of the Ultimate Universe, including the Avengers and Nick Fury. But Nick Fury himself saw the same promise in Miles he had in Peter when he kept tabs on the teenage Peter Parker throughout the Ultimate Spider-Man run. He recognized in Miles the same drive, naivety, and strength of character. From a writing perspective, conversations like this are a way to alleviate the fears of many fans writing in at the time that they didn't want Miles to just be a diversity replacement. Nick Fury and the other heroes recognizing Miles' qualities in common with Peter are an easy way to identify to the reader that while the two are different in many ways, Miles has the same foundational aspects that make Spider-Man a hero. Like Peter Parker, he has his own issues to deal with outside of the suit, but he also strives to represent the same ideals. He's young, impulsive, inexperienced, and naive because, like Ultimate Peter, he was also a teenager, but when it mattered most, he made the right choices and put himself on the line to help those in need. In his send-off issue for the character, writer-creator Brian Michael Bennis, who had shepherded the now-iconic Ultimate Spider-Man run for a decade, talked about creating Miles, echoing some of Stan Lee's earlier comments. 
quote, We talked about Spider-Man. If you look at the basic building blocks of his origin, where he's from, what motivated him, there's really nothing that said this character should be Caucasian. In fact, you could argue that there's very little that says he should be. Even in creating Miles, which the creative team knew was risky, they looked to what made Spider-Man, Spider-Man. What made the character a pop culture mainstay for over half a century? And from the success of Miles and other Spider characters, it turns out Spider-Man isn't just Peter Parker. Over several successful comic book runs and the rocky journey from the collapse of the Ultimate Universe into the main canon, Miles Morales is now Spider-Man. Not the only Spider-Man, if the titles of these crossover events are to be believed, but Spider-Man nonetheless. Despite a vocal positive reaction from fans from quite literally the beginning of Miles' story, there was also a lot of negativity towards Miles, as I've mentioned. And I'll give you three guesses as to why, but you probably only need one. A lot of it came down to the same things Synthetic Man whined about. Diversity, replacing Peter, thing different, want thing to be same. And many of these complaints have persisted. Now you might think, because they've persisted through several uh, consecutive comic runs, two major films, and now a trilogy of big budget games, they might have some merit. Well, let's look at why some people say Miles Morales isn't Spider-Man. We'll see additional complaints about diversity sprinkled through, but for now, let's look at the other common complaints, like Miles not having any unique villains. Other than I wish he could have his own villains and kind of become his own man. If you remove Miles from over half or not more of the game's story, not much would really change. And that's more damning than anything else. And his main villain in this game being Mr. Negative for obvious reasons if you played the original game, when that's also a Peter Parker Spider-Man villain, it just keeps proving the same point. Miles needs his own villains. Prowler is a great start. He just needs like 10 or more Prowler-like unique enemies. Despite chiding someone else in this video for not reading comics, he cites Prowler as a Miles villain, yet he didn't start that way in the comics. Yet also neither did Mr. Negative, but somehow he's still Peter's villain here. But who am I to correct these people who obviously know what they're talking about? Nobody is saying he's not a Spider-Man. He for sure is a Spider-Man, but when you talk about Spider-Man, everyone just assumes Peter Parker, because Peter Parker is Spider-Man. He's the guy who built that character. So naturally, you have to put Miles Morales in there if you want to differentiate between the two of them. You don't have to do that with Peter Parker. He makes the point that everyone thinks of Peter Parker as Spider-Man, but misses very similar cases have occurred with Green Lantern, Flash, Robin, Iron Man, and hell, even Venom. Because those titles, like Spider-Man, are mantles. They are monikers that the characters live up to. The complaint that Miles doesn't have any villains of his own isn't only lobbed at the game, but Miles in general. It's not necessarily true in the game. As much of Spider-Man 2, his primary protagonist is Mr. Negative, who serves as a living lesson in Miles in putting the past behind him and doing what's right. While he is a villain to Peter originally in the first game, that doesn't mean he can't also be a personal nemesis for Miles. That's not how stories work, because Mr. Negative killed Miles' father, so that makes him a pretty, pretty personal enemy. Aside from Mr. Negative, Miles' lack of unique enemies is less a problem with Miles than it is a general lack of new Spidey villains or comic book villains in general. Several classic villains like Hobgoblin and Mr. Negative have become more associated with Miles. Also, Prowler, and the very personal story of the new Tinkerer from Spider-Man Miles Morales. There are comic baddies like The Assessor, Rabble, Bombshells, Quantum, Salim, Shift, The Spot, The Bumbler, and Ultimatum. And if you're saying, hey, these don't sound like top shelf icons, yeah, because unlike most Spider-Man villains, they haven't been around 50 plus years and across a variety of shows and games. It doesn't change the fact that across all his incarnations, in comics, games, and film, Miles has villains that are uniquely tied to him and not Peter in any way. When it comes to the game, this criticism gets tied to an argument that Miles doesn't have any reason to be in the game, that he doesn't play a major role in the story. The game just keeps going. There's a mission where you have to rescue Miles' mom and Genki from a subway. Why the hell is this even a mission? Again, it's just padding. It's like they forgot that Miles has nothing to do with this story so they just had to insert this here so he says miles has nothing to do in the story 
except for him helping Peter and being the catalyst for his friend's recovery and helping Peter get the antivenom and also dealing with a slew of his own issues that allow him to nobly live up to the self-sacrifice set by Peter so he can confidently take on the mantle of Spider-Man and allow Peter to move on with his life instead of constantly struggling and always ruining his relationships. But sure, Miles has nothing to do with this story. It's almost like they're saying if you took Miles out of the story, Peter's story could have all those elements change and you wouldn't notice Miles is missing. But that's just how stories work. Like, if you take out all the scenes with one character in a movie, that character will be missing, but then so is everything they did, why they were in there to begin with. Like, you could add all kinds of playable characters and their stories to a game and change it if you wanted, but... Developers usually try to keep it focused on the story they want to tell, which is why Miles is there, because he's an important part of the thing. Another point that gets brought up is that there's not enough difference between Peter and Miles, or that he's just a clone. In terms of ability, it's easy enough to hand wave this away with Miles' unique bioelectrical powers and invisibility, but how is his personality different? Where Miles decides obviously not to kill him, which I think is definitely the wrong move it's way too boring it's yet another thing that makes miles way too similar to peter but without any of the character flaws when it comes to actions like this that's the point miles isn't a clone of peter parker in any universe he's in he has his own friends his own hobbies his own family dynamic but he's had similar experiences and like nick fury recognized in his ultimate appearance the same tenacious power of will Ironically, the thing people complain about when it comes to Miles making decisions how Peter would and how that doesn't make him a good Spider-Man is that's exactly what makes him a valid interpretation of the character. Finally, there's the good old diversity argument, which is what I feel so many of these criticisms just come down to, or at least most of them certainly get around to it. And that's saying that Miles was made to implement and push a diversity quota. This really just smells like old-fashioned racism to me. Because Miles isn't white, he has no reason to exist aside from filling a diversity quota. Some nebulous, fear-mongering invention people like this rely on to make their point seem well-reasoned. Here's the problem with that. Aside from his original appearance, Miles has never outright replaced Peter Parker. As in Peter's gone, Miles is there. And even in the Ultimate Universe, Peter came back in some form. In the current comic continuity, they both exist as Spider-Man, which is the dynamic in the game, with one taking on a mentor role and one being more of a Padawan. It's not like you can't play the white Spider-Man in the game. It's not like you can't go buy a Spider-Man comic book with Peter in it right now. Or see a Spider-Verse movie where Miles is the main character, but Peter also shows up in some capacity. Peter Parker, Spider-Man, I still would argue right now, I think Spider-Man's the most popular superhero in the world. I think Spider-Man appeals to a younger audience, which, you know, obviously drives numbers even higher. I think Spider-Man's the most popular. In making this change, I, I don't think that they understand the ramifications of this uh, and how, how big of an impact that you're going to get. At the end of the day, if you are going to make Miles Morales the center point of the Spider-Man universe, it's going to have a big drop-off. Uh-huh you knew eventually they were going to get to this point because it's never on good faith when they are introducing and promoting diversity and how we need more diversity in here because it's important. This is the end result. This is always the end result of it right here. I love that bit there. Saying promoting diversity is never in good faith because it really just lays out their entire culture war game plan. It's so plainly worded here that they literally don't think promoting other people, other ideas can be in good faith. So I want to ask, why is diversity bad to these folks? Let's say for a minute that the all-powerful ESG score they keep talking about is driving ideas about diversity and representation of other genders, abilities, and ethnicities and media. Why is that a bad thing? We've already seen how they react to deaf people with mockery at the idea of other people's experiences. But literally everyone I've shown that section to, including people who play games regularly and people who barely play games at all, have all reacted positively, sometimes overwhelmingly so. They weren't interested in a Spider-Man game until I showed them a side mission with a deaf person. And I realized that's really anecdotal, but it got me thinking a bit. If seeing this kind of representation gets somebody interested, then 
what would seeing Miles or a gay couple do? The only real reason I can think of why those things would be bad is because somebody was personally biased against black people or gay people. Why else would someone care? The things that make Spider-Man, the man in the mask, a hero have to do with virtues like self-sacrifice, a sense of justice, empathy, all things we've talked about. What Spider-Man stands for has very little to do with him being white or a man. Those are parts of Peter Parker's identity, but Spider-Man? Not so much. Sure, Peter Parker is Spider-Man because Peter is self-sacrificing and empathetic. But if someone else were just as noble, just as understanding and kind, does it really matter who's under the mask to the people who need saving? Miles is different than Peter. Miles does have his own villains, powers, and identity. Then why are people still so intent on saying Miles Morales can't be Spider-Man? He absolutely can. It's not like there's no precedent in comics like I've already mentioned. Hell, there's precedent for Spider-Man being a different person, like Ben Riley or Miguel O'Hara. But then what makes Miles Spider-Man? I'm not asking can he be a valid Spider-Man. We've just shown that he can be an entirely valid interpretation of the character. But take away those petty complaints. Why is Miles Morales Spider-Man and not just Miles Morales? I've spoken a bit on how he lives up to that mantle, how he has the same sense of justice and fortitude as Peter Parker, but is that alone enough in a world of superpowers to be Spider-Man? To answer that question, we need to get at what it really means to be Spider-Man on a personal level, what it means for a character themselves to accept that title. And to answer that, we need to go into the Spider-Verse. For what I imagine is an overwhelming amount of Fairweather comic book and film fans, Into the Spider-Verse was their first experience with Miles Morales. The film was incredibly well received, winning an Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, breaking in tons at the box office, and sparking a new wave of popularity for characters like Spider-Gwen and Miles. Before Spider-Verse, these characters were popular in the comics, but now they are almost completely synonymous with the Spider-Man brand, even for small kids. All in all, this movie is one of the best arguments you can make against the go woke, go broke crowd. The story is almost entirely original, taking elements from the Spider-Verse comic crossover, wisely throwing out this Castlevania reject, sprinkling in a little bit of Miles' ultimate Spider-Man origin, and opting to focus on Miles' personal journey to become Spider-Man. For much of the film, Miles struggles with his new powers. He's excited, but also scared and fighting alongside several other seasoned spider people he feels inadequate and in over his head personally i love this little bit of great visual storytelling in the spider cave when he looks up at the suit and is preoccupied with the logo on his chest he feels inadequate to take on such a heroic role like peter parker watched his own uncle die miles loses his who turned out to be a supervillain sent to kill him the way uncle aaron is characterized is incredibly nuanced for a animated film, and from small reactions between Miles and his father, the viewer can gather that while Miles' dad is estranged from Aaron, Aaron is still proud of Miles, his artistry, and his ingenuity. He sees his nephew as a good kid, doing his best in school, and having himself turned to a life of crime doesn't want that future for his nephew. As Miles holds his dying uncle's hand, Aaron reassures him, you're on his way, just keep going. Here is the supervillain putting his hopes into this young hero who wants to do the right thing but doesn't know how to. The moment is cut short when Miles is forced to flee as his police officer father finds him over the body. It's a foundational moment for Miles as he's struggling with feeling like he couldn't live up to his expectations of not just school and the life his parents want for him, he suddenly has to contend with superpowers. And when he's needed most, he fails to help his team and his uncle dies protecting him. And the hits keep coming because the team of spider people get ready to enter their final showdown and return to their own universes, yet they leave him behind fearing he will only be a liability. And all of this happens because Miles Morales here isn't Spider-Man yet. Just like when Peter Parker's uncle died, he wasn't Spider-Man yet, not really. He had the powers of Spider-Man, he had the will to do the right thing, but he hadn't taken what Peter in the movie calls a leap of faith. And when Miles is at his lowest, when all hope seems lost, and he seems like he has let everyone down, 
he gets up and takes that leap. The What's Up Danger scene is an artistic masterpiece of not just visual design, but the thematic culmination of a story. After his uncle's death, Miles' father comes to deliver the news. He can see his son is on the other side of the door and accepts he might not want to talk. Unbeknownst to him, Miles really can't. So Jefferson simply speaks from his heart to his son, relating to him that even if he doesn't always say the right thing, he knows Miles has the strength uh, to do something amazing in his life, and he doesn't want to grow distant from him. This, of course, driven by the loss of his estranged brother. This serves as a moment of inspiration for Miles, to accept his newfound powers. For the whole film, he's been afraid of the responsibilities that come with power, both in terms of simply growing up or gaining superpowers, and what it might mean. He returns to the spider lair, and this time he's not worrying about the symbol anymore. He sees himself in the suit. As the scene plays out, voiceover can be heard from several other characters, conveying to the viewer what Miles is thinking of. He thinks back to Peter telling him he won't know when he's Spider-Man. It's a leap of faith. The film takes the stance, through this lesson for Miles, that there's no magical formula for being a hero. It's not something you can prepare for, but a decision you make. To get up and keep fighting. To accept the role you play and the responsibilities it brings. Of course, the will to do the right thing is important to being Spider-Man, but Spider-Verse makes it clear that anybody can do that. Here's Miles teaching the same lesson Stan Lee began Spider-Man with. It's not the power that makes you a hero. It's the choices you make. The film ends with a monologue from Miles saying anyone can wear the mask. It's a fun, inspiring message that allows anyone to envision themselves as a spider person of any stripe or creed. By the way, drop your spider sonas below. But more than that, it's a capstone for what it means to be Spider-Man. Power and responsibility, sure, but anyone can have that. It's what you do with it that matters. To keep fighting, to do the right thing. It's the movie's way of saying, if you can live up to that mantle, you can be Spider-Man. Of course, not in real life. Superheroes aren't real. But neither is someone as selfless as Peter Parker, or Miles Morales for that matter. I don't want to get into some pseudo-intellectual drivel about how superheroes are modern Greek myths because, no. But I do think there are reasons why these characters have been so broadly popular since their inception. Why, even back in the 60s, people of every demographic saw a bit of themselves in Spider-Man. It's nice to imagine a world where we could individually make a difference. And it's an amazing fantasy to picture ourselves as the hero of that story. And you might say, well, this is just the movie. What about the games? Miles isn't good enough to be Spider-Man in those. But he is. Real quick, I'm going to take a quick detour to the sequel, Across the Spider-Verse, and the idea of the canon event. In Across the Spider-Verse, Miles learns that after the multiverse events of the first film, a group of Spider-People have formed to fix the multiverse. Upon visiting the Spider-Society and being explained everything by Miguel O'Hara, the vengeful Spider-Man 2099, Miles learns about the canon event, something he disrupted in another universe. It's the idea that every spider person has to go through foundational developments. Essentially, the hardest parts of life are what define us. That every Spider-Man is united by experiences of loss and tragedy that they have chosen to make the best of. Miguel shows him an assortment of events like losing uncles and symbiote infections that unite most spider people. Learning that one canon event would likely mean the death of his father, Miles tries to escape to rescue his father at the risk of another multiversal break. Along the way, he learns he's not like other Spider-Man. He wasn't meant to be bitten. It wasn't a part of fate. There's an argument to be made here that, well, that means Spider-Man isn't Miles Morales. Miles Morales isn't Spider-Man. He was never meant to be bitten. He's an imposter. But that isn't what the movie itself is saying. Miguel, being obsessed with restoring order, has convinced others that things like loss of life is tolerable. It doesn't occur to other characters like Peter B. Parker that this change has come too gradually to notice. That by trying to fit choices into a predetermined path of who lives and dies, and that it has to be that way, they've stopped being the heroic ideal of Spider-Man. Miles escapes, and Gwen becomes insubordinate. As Gwen is sent back to her dimension, she seems to awaken that idea in the other spiders. We were supposed to be the good guys. What the film is getting at here, and why I bring it up, isn't that Miles is somehow a mistake or that he can't be Spider-Man, because in this story, in this, at the end of this movie, 
he's the one most embodying what it means to be Spider-Man, to not take any losses, to not stand by idly and do nothing. And what's more, like that original Peter in the comics, he wasn't chosen by some great force of destiny. He was just a regular kid who had an accident and got superpowers. And these canon events, these defining moments for each hero, happened to Miles in the games too. He overcame personal adversaries. He doesn't run away when Peter is down for the count and things look bad for him. He suffered the loss of his own father and had to come into his own with very little help. And in Spider-Man 2, after Miles fights to get to the man who killed his father, he chooses to put the past behind him and not be defined by vengeance. When Peter is in danger of killing Kraven, someone who definitely deserves it, Miles fights harder than ever before to save his friend. And when he's not saving the world, he's helping random people around the neighborhood, like a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man would. I talk so much about the Spider-Verse films because they chart out so well what it means to be Spider-Man. What, according to the established canon of the character, does it take to be a hero? Not much. Anyone can be a hero if they have the will to do the right thing and the bravery to do it. That's why in every universe, Miles Morales is Spider-Man. Not because it's meant to be, but because he chooses to be. Is Miles replacing Peter in the next game? I don't know, probably not. Odds are, Pete makes a third act return for maximum impact, but after everything the character has sacrificed, fought for, and knocked back down from, is Miles Spider-Man? Absolutely. In Spider-Man 2, both he and Peter perfectly embody what Spider-Man has been for so long in their own unique ways. And if someone just prefers Peter's average dorkiness to Miles' um, exaggerated swagger? Why does that need to be chalked up to a culture war issue? I don't understand why diversity for a character who means so much to so many is a bad thing. At the end of the day, they both represent an optimistic, fantastical hero. One that also isn't real. But like Stanley always intended, that doesn't mean their stories can't teach us lessons about the real world. In the real world, people who just live their lives as gay people or people of color get harassed and called names and belittled for no reason. People wanting to include others, share spaces, and tell stories that can continue resonating with new and old audiences get accused of pandering, of hating the franchises they show obvious love for. Which is why we need diversity in games like Spider-Man 2, because at least in a fictional world, people there can be happy and unafraid. If there's a reason Spider-Man in all the various incarnations has continued to inspire both adults and children, it's because of the incredibly simple yet resonant message that anyone can wear the mask. That doesn't mean anyone can be a superhero. Superheroes aren't real. But it does mean that anybody can choose to be a hero. Anyone can choose to be selfless, to give for others, to get up and keep fighting for what's right, no matter how the odds are stacked against them. And I think everyone deserves to see themselves in that spectacular story. Spider-Man, through decades of fiction, childhoods, movies, franchises, comics, and games, has always been about empathy and understanding, and most powerfully, the choice to be those things. This massive misunderstanding of what a character means, or that they've suddenly been changed to push a social justice agenda, isn't new, and it's not going away anytime soon, but neither is the fact that these fan bases have always been diverse, the properties have always valued progressive attitudes, and the people speaking out loudest against them don't realize they're not the heroes of the story. Spider-Man 2 as a game is just fine. It's a wonderfully crafted product with obvious love and reverence for its source material. It drags in the back ends and feels slightly rushed, so there are definite things to critique here. Yet because we are in a constant state of culture war, where nobody can separate enjoyment from personal bias, a bunch of people got mad that the game had gay people and a biracial Spider-Man. Yet, Spider-Man 2, for all its flaws with a rushed third act and minor gameplay issues, is still a quintessentially Spidey experience. It embodies the best of what the hero can be and why he's so beloved. And it does so by focusing on a wider view of society than just the perspective of a skinny straight white guy. 
If there's a lesson to learn here, it's not a new one. It's something many of us learn from heroes like Spidey when we were young, a lesson that I think many still need to learn. I think Stan himself put it best. So I'll let his words take over here. Let's lay it right on the line. Bigotry and racism are among the deadliest social ills plaguing the world today. But unlike a team of costumed supervillains, they can't be halted with a punch in the snoot or a zap from a ray gun. The only way to destroy them is to expose them, to reveal them for the insidious evils they really are. The bigot is an unreasoning hater, one who hates blindly, fanatically, indiscriminately. If his hang-up is black men, he hates all black men. If a redhead once offended him, he hates all redheads. If some foreigner beat him to a job, he's down on all foreigners. He hates people he's never seen, people he's never known, with equal intensity, with equal venom. Now, we're not trying to say it's unreasonable for one human being to bug another, but although everyone has the right to dislike another individual, it's totally irrational, patently insane, to condemn an entire race, to despise an entire nation, to vilify an entire religion. Sooner or later, we must learn to judge each other on our own merits. Sooner or later, if man is ever to be worthy of his destiny, we must fill our hearts with tolerance. For then, and only then will we be truly worthy of the concept that man was created in the image of God, a God who calls us all his children. Hi everybody, and thank you very much for watching. As you can tell, I kind of pulled out all the stops with this one. I got Spidey set up in the background. I'm wearing my, my Gwen costume. Uh, I did full like motion animatics, which I, I had to make all those PNG files. I worked incredibly, ridiculously hard on this passion project because I wanted to end the year on uh, a more passionate and positive note. And I hope that this did that. I will be going back to more in-depth and uh, very intensive political stuff in the new year. And I hope that you stick around for that. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving a few dollars down below. I haven't had any actual sponsors. So while I do get YouTube ad revenue, I pretty much mostly make all my money from Patreon and then whatever ads I get here. I don't show for a whole lot of products on here. So if you would like to get uh, additional looks at videos like this as they're being made, and even things like I'll be adding Discord access soon uh, to the, the second tier up, you can go check out my Patreon down below or just give a couple bucks to the links either way. I appreciate it, and I hope this video has been fun and engaging and interesting, and I want to thank everybody who has helped me so much grow my channel this year. Um, if, if you don't care about this sappy shit, you can skip right to the end, but this year has been life-changing in a number of ways. When I started the year, I was just about to break a thousand subs on YouTube. And that was after about a year and a half, two years of working on a channel. I had done these big documentaries and like videos that I had put so much time and effort and soul into and nobody cared. And now I'm able to do it as a full-time job. And I do have an audience that cares um, and supports me. And it is every day I wake up and I am There are not words to contain the gratitude that I want to convey to everybody, other content creators, other commentators, the, the people who have been in my comments, people who have reached out to me privately, because I, I would not be here. I would not be making cool videos like this without your help. And I hope that you will all continue joining me on this journey because I have a lot of big things ahead and a lot of things I still want to do. And... I want to thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your year.